you know, nowadays, anybody can pick up professional publishing software. You know, you can pay for the Adobe suite or you can get, you know, one or two others that are, are free or cheap and, and, and make something look pretty good. Yeah. And you can go on Kickstarter and, and make even a couple of thousand bucks, even if it's only just PDF or something. Right. And, and that low barrier to entry has created a lot of, eh, but also some incredible creative gems, right? It's possible that Deadlands is the most popular Weird West RPG ever made. Today, I sat down with the creator, Shane Hensley. He founded Pinnacle Entertainment, created Deadlands, that led to creating Savage Worlds, one of the most popular universal systems out there, and is someone who's been a part of the RPG conversation for several decades. There are two exciting things happening this week. One, Pinnacle is launching their Super Powers Companion for Savage Worlds. Unfurl your capes and hang on to your cowls because they're going to be crowdfunding that campaign on their site. So you can go to peginc.com, link is just in the show notes, to check it out. Savage Worlds, coupled with the Superpowers Companion, will allow you to do your four-color supers campaign using the popular Savage World system. Secondly, on Thursday, September 2nd, on the Third Floor Wars Twitch channel, we're premiering our run at Deadlands. It's going to be based on a one-shot that Shane Hensley wrote and that he uses when people ask him to run Deadlands. Anyway, sit back, relax, and enjoy my time with Shane. Third Floor Wars delivers interviews, insights, and discussions about everything hitting the tabletop. Rule books, plastic models, dice, and cards in hand. Let the gaming begin. Tabletop games let you escape and unleash grand battles and regale epic tales of adventure with your friends. If you love gaming and learning from players, designers, experts, and creators, you are in the right place. Pull up a chair. Craig and Ray welcome you to the third floor and the Tabletop Talk Podcast. Howdy, friends. Craig here. Today, we're talking to Shane Hensley. Shane is Pinnacle Entertainment Group's founder and is known for the Deadlands and Savage Worlds RPGs. Shane, welcome to the third floor. Hi. So you've been busy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I am the proud owner of your Savage, most recent Savage World uh, Kickstarter. Well, thank you. I am very recently the proud owner because I just got my fulfillment of my Deadlands um, Fantastic. setting. And um, boy, oh boy, that uh, that takes a whole lot of work. Um, and they're gorgeous. They're absolutely gorgeous, man. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, it did take a lot of work. And it took a lot of work to ship them, too. You I know, can't one imagine. of the side effects of the the pandemic, and uh, this is not a, uh, I'm not really casting an opinion here. It's just data. People can, can form their own opinions. But because of unemployment insurance and stimulus checks, it is really hard to find people to work warehouse jobs. Got it. So our partner, Studio Two, uh, is offering, I think, close to like 150% of minimum wage in their area. And this is, you know, literally just to pick and pack orders. You know, great people, great place to work, all that good stuff. And they just can't find anybody because the moment huh. you work, you don't get unemployment uh, benefits, right. which had been extended, right? So again, I'm not casting an opinion saying that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's just data. And, uh, you know, we don't want to go out and tell people, well, your shipment's taking a while because of X, because then it gets into a big political discussion and blah, blah, blah. Sure, sure. You know, there are realities to these things that uh, the unintended consequences, right, that people don't think about. So I'm sure that's exactly how you wanted to start this conversation, right? <laughs> well, our next subject is abortion. You want to dive into that, <laughs> well, Let's go. <laughs> no, um, but, uh, yeah, well, it's, I, um, I can't imagine the amount of labor it takes because, uh, I, like I said, it, uh, it, it's beautiful work. But I want to go way back. I did want to start off by complimenting you on two just uh, – I've – embarrassingly a no large number of Kickstarters under my belt as a consumer. Me too. Um, and uh, the two that I've gotten from you have more than stood up to it. Uh, so I thought that would be a good way to get things started. But I want to go back in time, long, long before Pinnacle existed. And the first time you learned you could pick up a pair of dice and write some words on a sheet of paper and pretend to be other people. I'm curious to know, Shane, how you found tabletop gaming. Sure. So uh, I am a comic book nerd from way back. I started reading them when I was about 
four years old, best I can recollect, uh, at the Scholastic Book Fairs they used to have at, uh, <laughs> at, our, at, our, at our schools. And we didn't get comic books there, but we got like the puzzle books and all the, the other stuff, right? So I got into comics. And somewhere in the 80s, <clears throat> when D&D got big, they used to run ads in the back of comic books. Mm-hmm. And there were a few, but the one that always sticks out in my mind ended with this big red dragon. And it says, greetings, mortal worm. <laughs> and I just thought that was the coolest thing. And that's where it ends, right? That's the cliffhanger. I don't know if there's another one after that or not. But I thought, oh, my God, what is this? I got to have it. Yeah. So I lived in uh, I lived in Ohio when I first saw it. And then we moved to rural uh, Virginia. And there's no bookstores, you know, within three and a half hours of where I grew up. And it was just really tough. But the Sears catalog used to carry Dungeons and Dragons. So I don't I think I knew figured, that. Yeah. As well as painted miniatures. The Dungeon Dwellers sets. Yeah, it's crazy, No right? kidding. Yeah, so I finally figured out what this thing was, and I asked my parents for it for Christmas, and somewhere, or, or, or some holiday, and somewhere between then and there, I discovered that um, it was either KB Toys or Toys R Us had some stuff, right, for D&D. But it was just a whole bunch of loose stuff thrown on literally like uh, shoe rack kind of thing. So, you know, here I am, 12, I guess. I have no idea what I'm looking at. There's Dungeon Geomorphs, the character sheets pack, and I remember uh, Bone Hill. Uh, oh, wow, yeah. Yes. What is it called? The Sinister? No, that's Sinister Secret of Saltmarsh. Uh, I don't know, Bone Hill, right? So I have no idea what to do with these things. And uh, finally, I find out about the red box. I get the red box. I teach it to a couple of friends, and we do everything wrong, right? We're just <laughs> messing up left and right. But we had so much fun doing it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, like everybody, you know, we made our characters that lasted forever. <clears throat> I still play some of them that to this day, not in the same campaigns or anything, but you know, sure. same, same concept. And then, you know, perhaps a little foreshadowing of, of what was to come. Uh, I got into some of TSR's other games like Marvel Superheroes, and I started doing Westerns with it and Conan and all kinds of stuff. I did Mad Max with it. Yeah, it was a blast. Using the old, the old TSR superhero rule set. Yeah. Look at you. Yeah, Look Jeff at Grubb's you. Set. It's just, uh, you know, it's a fantastic set. Got a few weird holes in it, but it was just yeah. a, you know, an amazing game. And it had so many revolutionary ideas like karma and stuff that you just yes. hadn't seen at that time. Yeah, it, it, it was way ahead of its time. It way was. ahead of its time. Um, yep. And uh, and fun to play. But I, I think you're the first, first first person I've talked to that hacked it, though. And oh, yeah. did it for other settings. Yeah, I made my own adventures. I, I still have them in my, my keepsake box, right? With like covers with the um, like the slanted uh, rectangle on the front, like Marvel yep. superheroes modules did. I drew my own Mad Max in there and all this <laughs> stuff. I still have the maps I used. I watched, um, I think it was Rio Lobo with John Wayne, and I did a big map with that, and we played you know, played a western. That's oh, great. that's fun. That's yeah. fun. So that, you know, that gets us into, you know, middle school, high school. Now, what often happens when I hear these origin stories is we take a break, right? Um, either in college or after college. I'd be curious if that happened to you. No, not at all. Um, so I know that my Midwestern friends had the whole satanic panic thing going on, but we played in the gifted and talented program at school. We played at the Methodist church that I went to when I was uh, younger. And then when I got into high school, we played in the public library. And, uh, you know, we got into Star Frontiers and whatever else was yeah. you know, new and cool at the time. So I never really had a break. And when I got into college, uh, funny enough, we got into a water gun fight with some guys on the floor. And uh, this guy, uh, he, he, we were throwing notes or something silly. I don't remember. And he said he called me a son of a gully dwarf. Nice. And I thought, oh, he knows D&D. <laughs> he he right? knew the code. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we started talking and uh, he was getting into uh, GURPS at the time. So we started yep. playing GURPS and we played GURPS Elric and um, another guy was running D&D. And we went out to his game and he started running GURPS Horror. And that became, that was uh, John Hopler and John Goff who had a ton of our earlier yep. pinnacle works. And, you know, we've been friends for 30 some years now because of that. Wow. Um, so, you know, so GURPS, GURPS was really big for me. Um, and uh, the listeners have uh, heard the story a million times. So I'm going to keep it real short, Shane. I'm a huge fan of role-playing games all through high school and college um, and then gave up nerd stuff for a little while, came back to it and found miniature gaming. And that's sure. originally what this podcast was founded on was miniature gaming. 
But about a year and a half ago, I came back to role playing and I was shocked <laughs> because since, you know, when I left, there was, you know, there was GURPS, there was Champions, there was D&D. I came back and things have changed a little bit. There's a lot more yeah. games to be played now. But um, do you consider GURPS kind of a landmark game for you as far as development and, you know, where you ended up headed? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> I think a lot of my friends played Champions. I never really got into Champions, but I played a ton of GURPS. And I think Steve Jackson, you know, just did a, a fantastic job with it. And, you know, we played, we played Conan and uh, Witch World and uh, Auto Duel and Fantasy. Like I said, Elric, so yeah. many different things. I think the the issue that I had with GURPS that eventually led me to create my own, and, and I think, you know, GURPS could still do, do this today. We have setting rules, right? So we can break outside the boundaries of the, the scale system. I also think rolling under is, is a problem in games. I think you want to roll up right sure, which is a big sure. deal for us but uh, the setting rules was uh, you know really the the key to our success that let us do all these different genres you know from pathfinder to rifts to deadlands and oh, and all this stuff and that's uh i i probably wouldn't have really understood that had i not played and loved so much curbs i right. still love it. Well, what I consider Savage World to be is kind of a nice compromise behind between a generic system and I don't know how do I put it like and, you know, our specific systems. Right. So um, there's benefits to having a system that's specifically built for a specific type of story right. in a specific type of setting. Um, there's also benefits to you learn GURPS and you can play freaking anything because there's two source books about every <laughs> setting you've ever dreamed of. Right. Right. Um, and Savage Worlds is a nice way of navigating it. So it's neat for you to see that the that same way is that kind of a negotiation between the two best of both worlds it, it was for me um you know when we when we made deadlands the original deadlands that was exactly the intent what you said a moment ago everything in there had to be flavorful and and part of the game the poker chips the cards for initiative you know, all that stuff it was supposed to feel like a you know a, a meta poker game while you're you know doing your combat and stuff uh, that system was just a little too heavy and clunky for how things would evolve over the next yeah. few years but what we found was we could take the best parts of that, you know, what we call bennies now that were, were fate chips, the cards for initiative, but maybe not five cards. So one guy's taking 20 minutes for his turn, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. And uh, as we figured that out, you know, now we get all the way up to like Flash Gordon, the shirt I'm wearing today, that has things like, you know, the cliffhanger cards. So, well, how do you get, and, and, you know, quick evolution, but how do you get a, a party to surrender? Player characters never surrender, right? Well, right. you let them choose to surrender because they get something cool for it. Right. That's and that's cool. what the cliffhanger card does. So there's just so many evolutions that came off this spine and this experience. Very, very cool. Um, well, great, guys. The Insider Insight series allows me to talk to developers, designers, artists, writers, and industry insiders about the creative process and how they approach their work. Today, we will pick Shane's brain and learn about his founding of Pinnacle, his work in the video game uh, City of Villains, which I'm really excited about talking about, and of course, his approach to creating two major iconic games, both in Savage Worlds and Deadlands. So we'll be right back. Hi, this is Brian. I started listening to Third Floor Wars for information and insight about my favorite miniatures game, Malifaux. But I also get great interviews with game writers, designers, and artists, as well as some fantastic role-playing sessions with some really great players. I've been supporting them on Patreon for a year and a half so far, and it has been well worth it. Right now is the part of many podcasts where someone comes on interrupts the show, and explains that you should consider paying for the content you're already getting for free. They'll go on and explain that by giving a dollar or more a month, you not only support the show, but you allow the show to grow and improve. Here on the third floor, we commit to not interrupting your episode of Tabletop Talk with such a plea. We pledge not to run a spot asking you to go to patreon.com and give a dollar or more a month. Even if there's a link in this show's description, and there is, we won't ask you to click it and become a patron. We won't spend time yammering about the benefits like early access to episodes, getting those episodes without ad breaks, or even getting a chance to play in one of Craig's RPG sessions. Anyway, enjoy this episode. We needed to clarify that we wouldn't do this type of solicitation. Time to give a quick shout out to our most recent patrons. A big thanks goes out to John Mahoney, Philip Masca, Joshua Edwards, 
Clay Purse, Peter Sojanek, King Salt Nathan, Jimmy CZ, Wayne Peacock, Oliver Borden, Zachary Wills, J. Douglas Nielsen, Patrick Healy, Ham Dog, Greg Packman, Eric Conrad, Alan Cardinal, Raven Zato, and Philip Savoy. Because of you and the 100 other plus patrons, I'm able to put out content on a regular basis. We appreciate you. So we learned a little bit how you developed as a gamer, Shane, but I'd be curious to know when does that suddenly turn into, I want to try to find a company for this. I want to make a living at this. What does that look like and when does that happen? So before I wanted to found a company, I worked for just about everybody. I wrote a ton of TSR stuff. I wrote a ton of Fossa stuff, White Wolf. Uh, My main uh, company that I worked for most of the time was West End Games. I did a ton of Torg and Shatter Zone and... Uh, Blood Shadows and everything they were working on. A lot of stuff that actually never came out as well. So uh, I did a lot of freelancing and I was in college and uh, I was, you know, fortunate enough that my parents could pay for my first year or so and keep me afloat, but I wanted to pay for the rest. And I, uh, you know, I worked, I worked a job and I, uh, I started writing in college to help pay, pay my own, own, pay my own way as well. And I got lucky and Western Games and Greg Gordon accepted a submission. And I thought, wow, I got paid for this. This is fantastic. And uh, it really just took off from there. And I found, uh, you know, as, as a quick shout out to everybody who wants to do this, you know, pay attention to the, the style guide or the instructions they give you and do the work, right? Do the homework. Yep. It's not just about having a cool idea. You know, you got to go back through and, and get the format right. You got to get your style and grammar and so forth right and know when it's okay to break it and so on. And then the hardest lesson was after I got the first few manuscripts back that looked like someone had slit their wrists over them in, <laughs> in red ink, I, uh, I improved, right? I, I learned how to get better and I turned things in on time and that led you know, to the work with TSR and bigger companies and eventually into computer games. So um, then eventually I, I had this idea for, we were playing a lot of historical miniatures, which you, you mentioned you're a big miniatures gamer. We were playing um, Age of Reason by T- Todd Fisher, I believe it was. And I got, uh, I got into colonial stuff. So uh, I know your viewers, your listeners can't see this, but my, my back wall is covered with Zulu, uh, Anglo-Zulu Wars art. Uh, I actually went on a, a tour and did the battlefields with, with Ian Knight and all kinds of amazing wow. stuff. It's just awesome. And I had to write my own rule set because I just didn't like anything that was out there at the time. So I decided to publish a game that was called Fields of Honor. And it, it strangely did very well. And I needed a little company or a logo to do that. It was sold through Chameleon Eclectic uh, by my friend Charles Ryan. And, you know, business is difficult and things didn't go so well on the business side, but the game did well. And then my buddy John Hopper, who I mentioned briefly before, he had a World War II collectible card game that he wanted to do. This was after Magic had come out and CCGs were all the rage. So that was the first game we published. No, we published that through Chameleon Eclectic too. And uh, when it came to Deadlands, I just knew I had to control it myself, right? The, the right. business side and everything else. And again, that's no aspersions on anybody. Business is tough. And especially back then, you know, the distribution was a very different beast than it is today. So long answer to say at that time, uh, Pinnacle had to become more real. And uh, I quit the day job that I had. I was managing a little software uh, company. I was really more like a creative director type. And went back to full-time freelancing for everybody I could, creating Deadlands. And I even worked on uh, like a Mars Attack card game for Tops and you know, anything I could get my hands on. X-Files. Sure. We did a Star Wars card game that never came out. All kinds of cool stuff. So it was a, it was a make sure you can pay the bills yeah. period, right, uh, while we were making our, our own stuff. And then we got lucky and Deadlands did well. So I'd be curious, Shane, when you look back at, uh, you know, that first war game and even that World War II card game, um, is there, you know, I'm sure there's a lot that you're not, you, you don't consider, you know, something you'd be proud of now. Not that you despair it now, but, you know, this was early designing for you, right? And I'm sure as a designer, you have developed considerably since then. But looking back on it, are there some early signs of what you would become as a creator when you look back at those? Well, you're you're assuming I became something awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's true, no, but Craig, I'm still in the first part of that question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, you know, I get to make what I want and and do it full time, and you know, provide a living for a few other people as well. So uh, that is success to me. I am happy. Sure, right? I'm content. Uh, there were some some hard lessons. One, 
Uh, I could, you know, we could do five days of podcasts on that. I'll, I'll give you a couple of quickies. Uh, Fields of Honor is a really cool little game. I'm, 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 I'm happy with it, but there's, there's this, stri- there's this weird mechanic where you roll the dice and look at them individually in one part, and then you add them up in another part, and people get confused about that all the time, right? So that taught me to be more clear with the game mechanics and how hard it is to teach. It also taught me sometimes if a mechanic works really, really well, you just have to live with it and, and try your best to explain it. Our shaken rules in Savage Worlds are like that. It takes people a little while to figure out how shaken works, but it works really well because it means, you know, you hit the little guys and then there's some timing issues about when you want to hit them again. That's some fun strategy. And then you get them off the table, right? A little tricky. There was a product we made uh, called Fields of Honor, the American War of Independence that came out um, long after all that had come out. It was my kind of attempt to merge a board game and miniatures game. And we didn't have the luxury of the printers that we have now. And the box that it was in was garbage. So when we tried to ship them places, you know, we got back, I think it was like 75% of, of what we sent just crushed. Wow. Right. So, and, and uh, some of the art just wasn't up to speed. And so on. I think the game was good, but it really taught me to appreciate production values and, yeah. and the materials better. And uh, I think what we make now, and I think if you look around, uh, Facebook, for example, and see what people are saying about the new Deadland stuff we just shipped. You know, I, we're, we're pretty proud of that. And you're right. It is a ton of work. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's how I started the podcast, right? It's just, I mean, I, I opened it up and I just go through it and, and it, you're right. It does matter. Um, now it doesn't mean that you can have a garbage game and make it pretty and it's going to do well. <laughs> right. right. But, right. um, it does mean to your point that you could have a good game that just won't get recognized and won't, and won't get found because of the production value. And then you can have the best of both worlds, which is you have a good game. That's beautiful. Um, and I've, right I've on. talked about, you know, and, and it's th- things like the quality of the components, which you mentioned with the boxes and, and the art work um uh it also gets into something you've talked about with is the quality of the writing right you can have a you can have a great game but if it's poorly written like literally poorly written then what good is it right yeah and we're i i I personally am super picky about that that doesn't mean that everything we make is gold right sometimes there's just realities or just different styles that may not mesh for a particular reader etc but uh when 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 manuscripts comes in when manuscripts come in we want to make sure that they are as fun to read as they are clear and easy and fun to play. Because we know that's how, you know, probably a majority of people will ever experience them, right, True. to read. So that's been important to me since day one. Yeah, very, very nice. So if we look at Pinnacle's time pre-Deadlands, um, what are some highlights that uh, you look back on fondly? So there really are just uh, those two products. There's Fields of Honor and, um, and John Hoppler's The Last Crusade, which is a fantastic game that uh, hopefully we'll bring back one day. But, you know, really at that time, it was the formation of the company and I was still doing a lot of freelancing for TSR and so forth. There's a, you know, print of a uh, bronze dark sun cover uh, on the back here, you know, one of my earlier uh, art pieces that I collected. That's not original, but it's signed, <laughs> signed nice. to me and my wife, you know, at Gen Con. So, you know, that was, uh, it was just a really great time. What, what I didn't, you know, I was 20 to 23 years old and made a lot of business mistakes. Uh, we had that early success. We invested it all in a computer game and that went bust. We were trying yeah. to do a, a turn-based game the year that Doom came out and 3D was all the rage. And, you know, that, that was kind of a, a disaster and it led to some, some really hard times on the business side. But, uh, you know, you stick with it, you work hard and you believe in what you're doing and maybe you get lucky. Maybe. And maybe maybe get a little stubborn too, possibly to say I refuse stubborn. to lose. <laughs> <laughs> pretty stubborn. So you have done work um, uh, in the computer game industry outside of Pinnacle, right? Yep. Um, you're involved with a game, and I didn't realize until I started researching you. Um, you're involved with one of my all time favorite computer games, which is City of Villains. Fantastic. Uh, oh yeah. So can you tell me a little bit how that came about and how you sure. fell into that? So one of the Deadlands spinoffs is Deadlands Hell on Earth, right, where we the bad guys win and we blew up the world. One of the freelancers that we used for that was a guy named Jack Emmert. And uh, Jack uh, wound up being part of Cryptic Studios when they launched City of Heroes through his buddy, Rick Dakin, his writing partner at the, partner at the time. Jack rose to become, uh, I think, the creative director and then partner or something and then CEO. And, you know, he shot right up to the top. Super smart guy. Good guy. You know, we, we became we became best friends through the years. 
And um, but long before that, before we became really good friends, uh, he asked me to come work on uh, City of Villains after the success of City of Heroes. And I was in one of those really bad times for Pinnacle. And I thought, man, I've, I've got to have a change. This is just this isn't working out. But I don't know if I want to move to California. <laughs> and then uh, so I met with Jack at Origins and his wife, Liz, and we talked and we just, you know, we hit it off. And that was really the beginning of the friendship part of it. And then I was lucky enough to go out and then I did join them and we moved west and changed our entire life and worked on City of Heroes, City of Villains. And then later on, I worked on three or four other games that, that Cryptic made, you know, some behind the scenes, some not. And then I got to uh, go make, because of that experience, I got to go make a Deadlands MMO that we worked on here in Arizona, which is why I moved to Arizona. Uh, that company, unfortunately, went bust, but we had some cool ideas and I, you know, I'm still proud of what we did. From there, I got to also be, I went back to Cryptic and became the executive producer on Neverwinter, which is an amazing game. All the great stuff I think other people did, but uh, I think my contribution <laughs> at the time, the, the team was in some rough ground because of some corporate takeovers and so forth. And I was able to, to help bring everybody together and get a vision and get things moving. And then when I left to go to Petroglyph, which is another one of my you know, great, great friends and my mentor, uh, Chuck Krogel runs that place. Uh, you know, they were, they were super successful over at Neverwinter. We worked on a game called End of Nations uh, at Petroglyph that unfortunately did not come out. And then just to tie it all up in a bow, I went back to work for Jack in Austin, Texas in 2017 on a game that's still not been announced. But it is just a, uh, it's a really big AAA game. And uh, I don't like... Um, I didn't like the the situation that I was in there. That's that's not important to anybody's story. Right. It certainly had nothing to do with Jack or the team or anything. So I left. But uh, the game is in it is in great shape. It'll come out probably next year or so, and uh, you will marvel at it. <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> so I'd be curious when you um, I mean, think how to phrase this. What do you think you brought or bring to the table when it comes to, to computer game design? Um, what is it that um, if I were to look back at City of Villains and look for your fingerprints or things that, um, you know, made you a valuable member of, of those teams? So that's a that's a that's a that's a great question that I've not been asked before. Um, I'm going to try to make it quick. Uh, there are there are differences between something uh, MMOs that I have mostly worked on. Uh, as opposed to something small. I did a game called Zombie Pirates with a group here in town. You can still find it on Steam. I think it still works. It might. It, it didn't get updated <laughs> because it got wound up getting owned by somebody else. We couldn't update it or anything. But it's an awesome little game. Very proud of it. It's basically a, a cheap mobile version uh, of, uh, not, not mobile as in phones, but things move around, of Plants vs. Zombies. Oh, okay. Uh, with a story and a really cool twist, if you watch the whole story. And that is that is very much a Shane thing, right? Got it. On MMOs, I tend to have a very different role. So early on with City of Heroes, City of Villains, um, I was the writer or a writer. Uh, Zeb Cook was one of the others. And then we both became designers later on too. But uh, there, I think, uh, really my main job was probably to tie things together that other people had already thought of. And then um, I did a lot of business development and pitches and, you know, because I can do layout software and so forth, I was able to make things look pretty once we had had nice art. So I became a bit of a pitch guy. Interesting. Uh, and then doing that, <clears throat> I think I, you know, I learned some lessons, some the hard way, some, you know, got lucky on. But uh, I, I think one of my strengths is bringing a, a team together and getting everybody on a vision, right? Because a lot of times when you step into a software company, especially – they have, well, you know, we want to do, we want to capitalize on the latest market trend. You, know, you get that from the, from the publisher. And like, okay. And we, we have this technology and these assets. So, you know, put them together and make a story out of it. Well, See you in a week. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, and they, there's a lot of confusion over, and it comes from the, the legacy of computer game history. We could, honestly, we could do hours on this, but they say, well, we don't really care about the story. And I say, well, that, it's not the story I'm trying to get you to understand. It's, it's, it's the whole concept, right? It's what, what fits inside the vision and what doesn't. Uh, End of Nations is a good example. When I got there, it was very unclear who the mission givers were. Is it the <laughs> UN? Is it a post-apocalyptic thing? Is it aliens? You know, it's, they didn't, they just, there had been different ideas. They knew that vehicles were going to run around cool maps and shoot each other. 
and then every time, you know, we would try to kind of pull that together into a, uh, a vision, it, it kind of became a story about plot, which is, you know, again, was not the goal. But that said, uh, you know, we took, we took a lot of disparate elements and got a lot of people on board to share the vision and feel like, you know, they're empowered to contribute to it and understand what fits in the cone and what doesn't. And uh, I, I was probably able to do that a little better on Neverwinter um, because, you know, it was kind of vacillating between is it a Dragon Age style game? Right. Is it like Neverwinter Nights, its predecessor, et cetera? And uh, you know, that's, that's the, I guess, the leadership role that, that I've, I've done. I've done a lot. You, other people can decide <laughs> if, if I'm going to get at it. Well, and it sounds like, too, that you're dealing with um, a very important intangible, which is tough, right? I mean, that's a concept that I think is difficult. Like me as a gamer, like you talk, what you're telling you makes total sense because that's the that's the that's the the intangible that makes me fall in love with a game that I might not be able to describe. Right. But it's the little details that what ties in, what gives it purpose that, that can make or break a game. It also determines how it gets made because you don't even know how to create a mission system right you know on on the programming side until you know what kinds of entities give missions what kind of interaction system is it is there yeses and nos are there rewards you know all that stuff right so it, it all follows from having that cohesive vision i kind of call it the cone you know there's 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 a, usually one vision holder at the at the the, the tip of the cone and he, he, he or she spreads out that vision and tries to get people on board. And eventually, once you have the cone, think of it like a, a gaming template, right? Ideas become very clear whether they fit inside it or don't down the, the descent of all the decisions that must be made. Is right. it server-based? You know, all the crazy little things. It, are there loot boxes? What are the loot boxes? Who's selling them to you? What's the in-game conceit? And if it feels... You know, marketing and corporate, it's not going to be nearly as successful as if it feels inherent and intrinsic to the game world. Right. So all these things trickle down from those decisions. And it's yeah. hard to do, especially in a big company with a, a publisher mandated set of goals. Right. Yeah, I bet. Um, how about some horror stories um, in uh, working in the computer gaming industry? Well, the hours are terrible. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I made uh, I made a lot of money in, in video games and I make a lot less now. But uh, I, I live the life I want to live, and uh, the, the hours are just bad. And, and here's the, I think, maybe the dirty unspoken secret. Yes, uh, publishers and companies often uh, inflict a lot of crunch on their employees, but the employees do it to themselves a lot, too. And I don't mean by working badly. What I mean is, so a lot of times when I was like an exec producer or something, my, all the things I needed to do were over at 3 or 4 p.m. Right. And then it was OK. We've got everybody on board. I've got new your resources, you know, go make the things. Right. And and then they they, they go off and, and do it. And uh, a lot of people in the video games industry are young. They don't have families and so forth. So they are happy to stay there till eight or ten at night because they don't often have other be you know, better things to do. And they can especially artists and so forth. They can watch videos while they're doing it. You know, it's it's a it's a pretty pleasant thing to do. And that's, again, that's not to disparage. That's, they're working hard. Sure. It's just a different style. But anybody who goes home suddenly looks like, well, you're not here nearly as much as these people, right? And you may have a family and kids and you're supposed to take them to sports and do all this other stuff. That is the worst part of yeah. video games. I think, too, the another thing that I didn't, I didn't like as MMOs developed, I loved the subscription model. Give us 15 bucks a month and we'll work our asses off to make something really cool for you. Yep. But then it became the, the free to play and, and how do we how do we addict you to the game so that you will give us, you know, 10 cents here and 50 cents there. And I, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's not for me. It's not right. the way I like to make stuff. So that was that was probably the beginning of the end you know, for me there anyway. Yeah. So, Shane, when you look back at your time doing that, um, did any of it end up influencing you as a tabletop designer and producer? Do you, do you find yourself pulling stuff that you got from that time and leveraging it now? Uh, I'd say, you know, team organization and stuff, I, you know, I learned from from the producer jobs. That's kind of the boring part of it. I think the, <laughs> the design fun stuff, I probably learned more as a player. Interesting. A great example is Sid Meier's Pirate. You know, you could probably program that thing right out of high school, right? Yeah. There's not much to it, but it's a brilliant game. And 50 Fathoms has 
a lot of that in its DNA. So in 50 Fathoms, you wind up being part of a crew on a, on a ship and you run around and you fight pirates or maybe you are pirates. You gather things, you go to ports, you, you buy and sell stuff, right? And what was brilliant about Sid Meier's Pirates is you would go to a, a, a port. If you've never played it you know, and, and you like game design, you should look into it. But there's just like four or five menu options, right? It's buy beer at the tavern and get a rumor, <laughs> hire some crew, you know, whatever. Uh, but so much story and imagination comes out of those little bit of, little bitty things. And eventually, I think you wind up, is it your sister? I think you're trying to rescue from some dread pirate or something. It's uh, that's That was kind of the progenesis for us of the plot point campaign. Interesting. Right? We can take these these you know five or six big adventure ideas, seed them throughout a campaign world, and then you move around and do what interests you and your party, and you will interact with them here and there. And in some of them, I think 50 Fathoms is one of our best. Some of them are much harder. Necessary Evil is one of our best settings on it. I just love it. But the plot point campaign is very reactive. You're kind of told what to do and where to go. So we, we, we learned from that and did better like in Necessary Evil Breakout, for example. So, yeah, sorry. You're, you're asking questions I could just answer for hours and hours. I'm <laughs> trying to be succinct. <laughs> But uh, <laughs> well, you gotta keep in mind Shane, that, that's my job. <laughs> my job is, okay. is when Shane gets boring, I ask another question. <laughs> so, All right, well, let's do that. <laughs> don't worry about that. Don't self censure yourself. This is fascinating because it, it, it's very. I've been talking to a lot of people in the industry um, as part of this podcast, and I'm amazed at how many people involved in tabletop gaming have either jumped full in at some point in their career in the computer game industry or have dipped their toes in and everything. There's a lot of cross pollination that happens there, um, which I have found fascinating, but um, your involvement with some of my uh, landmark games that I loved as a player is, is a big deal. Um, guys, we're going to take a break. When we get back from this break, we're going to talk about what we've been skirting around because I want a whole segment devoted to that. I want to talk about one of my all time favorite games and that's Deadlands. We'll be right back. If you're an athlete, you know the greatest motivator of all is the fear of letting your teammates down. After all, a team is only as good as its weakest link. So you owe it to those wearing the same jersey as you to be your best every time you step on the field. That's why there's no vape in team. When you vape, you can expose your lungs to toxic chemicals that can damage your lungs. If you're a step behind, the team's a step behind. Brought to you by The Real Cost and the FDA. Howdy friends, Craig here. You deserve a new play mat. Here on the third floor, we use mats by Mars. They are scratch resistant, waterproof, wet erase marker compatible, almost free of glare and lighter than neoprene. Mats by Mars gives you over 40 designs to choose from. You pick a mat, pick a design, and then you pick an overlay, like one for Marvel Crisis Protocol, Star Wars Legion, or even Malifaux 3rd Edition. Those overlays will really speed up your deployment and make the placement of objective markers so easy. Use our promotion code in the show notes to get a 10% discount on your first order. In the notes of your order, you can even request the third floor logo on your mat for free. That makes the best mat in the business even a little better. So get some new mats, save yourself some money, and help support the show. Go to matsbymars.com. All the details are in the show notes, including the discount code. Um, so, uh, listeners, a lot of my listeners are come for the Malifaux content. So I'm a, uh, that's the primary tabletop game that we cover is Malifaux from weird games. And one of the things that drew me to Malifaux was weird West. Like literally I was tired of playing Warhammer and being part of that world. And, uh, I was like, you know what? I want a weird West mini game. I want to play weird West. And, uh, that's how I found Malifaux. But my love of weird West is tied to Deadlands, but I need to go back. So where is the very beginnings happen? So long before it had a name or anything, when you uh, forensically look back at the uh, seeds, where, where are the initial seeds that become Deadlands? Yeah, so um, it has to start with a love of Westerns, right? Because none of the other stuff would have popped up first <clears throat> had it not. And I guess most Sundays, you know, back in the days of three channels, <laughs> I was watching John Wayne Westerns with my dad. And I loved them. Big Jake is my all-time favorite. There are better Westerns. Big Jake is, is Big the Jake's one I a good will movie. never turn off, right? Yeah. It's just fun. And the uh, 
that's where it starts. I actually had had not seen Clint Eastwood movies uh, until much later on, and I didn't really watch them until after Deadlands, even though Deadlands is a spaghetti western. Yeah. So strangely enough, that that's just the, the cycle there. So where the idea came from, um, I've told this story many times, so I'll, I'll I'll be brief. But we were at Gen Con, probably '94, I think it was, and White Wolf used to put out a magazine called White Wolf. Yep. And they would give the magazine away at Gen Con and Origins. And that Gen Con, uh, it had a Brom cover of an undead uh, vampire against a Confederate flag. And I didn't know he was a vampire at the time. I, you know, he was just pale with the crossed guns. And it was just a really cool, inspiring image. And we were working on uh, selling stuff with Chameleon Eclectic, as I mentioned before, Fields of Honor, Last Crusade, whatever Charles had out, uh, Millennium's End and so on. And I think I was driving the truck that year. And it's a 16-hour drive from Gen Con back to Blacksburg, Virginia, where I lived at the time. And uh, somewhere through the night, I couldn't get the image, that that Brom poster, out of my head. And I kept thinking about, uh, it kind of came unbidden, but a hand shooting up out of a grave at Boot Hill, right? And I got to thinking, well, what would be, what would make this person you know, fight through hell itself to come back to our world. What was so important to him? And and it just started growing from there. Okay, you know, there has to be some sort of uh, force that's causing evil and magic, uh, especially if it's if it's new. And that's where the Reckoners came from. Although I just called them the Four Horsemen at the time. John Hoppler came up with "There Will Come a Reckoning," uh, mm-hmm. the the slogan that we made famous, and that's they became the Reckoners. Uh, Greg Gordon, uh, I invited Matt Forbeck and Greg Gordon to my house in Blacksburg to form the new pinnacle and make Deadlands. And Greg came up with Smith and Robards. Uh, I don't remember who came up with Hucksters, which are our uh, card hurling wizards. It might have been Greg, might have been Matt, might have been me. I don't know, but it definitely came out of that that basement meeting. And um, we just, you know, we started boiling all these ideas together. And we thought, this is awesome. We're all excited about it. I ran some games and we thought, well, this is great. We're going to sell 2,000 copies and then we'll do something else. <laughs> and, you know, it, it blew up and we yeah. got lucky. But because we thought it was going to blow up, literally, you know, sell 2,000 and be done, it, just, it was a tough time in the RPG industry. Uh, that's why I, I created Hell on Earth then and there. I thought, well, let's do something cool. Let's have the bad guys win. Right. And I said, okay. I don't, I don't care what I sell. I just want to make the thing I want to make. Yep. Which is a, a, a frequent problem for, <laughs> for young designers, <laughs> but got lucky there too. And, you know, that we only had to massage it a little and say, well, this is a possible future because, you know, Deadlands is still successful. And yeah. man, you know, it just grew and grew. And then so many people added so many great elements to it through the years. Anybody who's seen the wall of orange of the original classic system. And all those source books are just chock full of brilliant ideas that you can still use in the game today and are still there in the game today. So if I'm understanding this correctly, was this the first RPG you released? It is the first RPG that wow. Pinnacle released. Yeah, I worked on several for other people, Got as it. I mentioned, including uh, the systems as well uh, and some miniatures game. We did even did a Torg miniatures game, which was you know, pretty insightful. But yeah, it was the first RPG released. Um, and you, you know, you've already talked about, you know, b- building, building the thematics and the mechanics together, right? Um, the, the ideas of the, uh, the poker chips and the initiative system and things like that. Um, but you also kind of talked about, you know, some anti, some uh, antiquated is not the word. There's things, things about the mechanics you didn't love. So when you look back at the design of, of the mechanics itself, what are some things you're glad to, or don't exist anymore? Well, so. We were literally trying to nail down like uh, the outlaw Josie Rail, Josie Wales, right? So there's uh, you know there's a, there's a couple of shootout scenes in there where he fires and you know he fans the hammer, bam, 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 the bullets chunk into the guy and he goes flying back. And we were trying to get that feel. And the the original classic system does that and it, and it does it well. The problem is, um, you know, we had both uh, the number of dice that you get. And the type of dice, you might have 3D4 or 5D10, and sometimes it could, you get into some analysis paralysis over which was better and all that kind of stuff. And it also just became a lot of dice to roll and count and and so on. And it still worked, uh, and we could, we could run it and fly through it at a, at a convention or something, right? But you could tell 
uh, in new players, it, it, there was a, a pretty steep learning curve. And when it really started to get a problem was with Hell on Earth, because now suddenly you don't just have a guy with a pistol or you know maybe a huckster throwing some cards. You've got fully automatic grenade launchers and tanks and missiles and Gatling guns and mini guns and all this crazy stuff. Right. So then it started slowing down really badly. And um, we had kind of a philosophy at the time, too, that every magic system would be different. So hmm. Indian magic was different than Huckster magic, than Blessed, than Mad Scientist, and so on. And that was really cool and sold a lot of splat books, which was, you know, what you did at the time. Yep. But it meant it was really a lot for the GM to keep up with and for I'm a player sure. to digest. So these days, you know, we take that setting rule idea we talked about earlier with GURPS. We have a, a, a fairly generic uh, magic system, so everybody can cast a, you know, a bolt if they want to damage uh, power. But it's the trapping. What does it look like? Right. That really matters because ultimately that's 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 really how it works. Yep. I even back in my TSR days, you know, we had a formula for how, how damaging spells worked at each level. And they really just look different but have different die types and so on. And of course there are cool things you can build into them. That's again not to despair, it's just different. Yep. But given we knew we were gonna make all these different settings and you know, my interests are all over the place, uh, we wanted that one cool system and then you could dress it up however you want. And add little yeah. modifiers here and there, and, and that we have them. Well, and it, it, you by by streamlining this, the mechanics, you still allow for the storytelling, which is really all we kind of care about. And yep. what's great is when the mechanics enhance the storytelling, as opposed to slow it down or get in the way, right? Yeah. So indulge me a moment, please. So uh, that's a big, big deal to me. So people look at an RPG book, and this is true of any RPG, right? It's not just ours. But they see all these rules and they think, well, man, that's going to take forever and I got to do all this stuff. I got to learn all these mechanics and it's all tactical and so on. And that is there for you when you want it. Right. But uh, I recently ran a, a weird whaling adventure that was just a, a gory hoot. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I ran a, uh, a Russian mafia adventure for my friends. All of it narrative, right? And it's, it's essentially our quick encounter system from the book, but it really mm -hmm. even, even dumbed down from there, right? Uh, you have to kind of trust the GM because if you roll a critical failure, I'm just going to do whatever I want to you and, you know, we're going to have fun and move on. There's not really tables and all that kind of stuff. But that's the way we, we tend to play most of the game. Wow. But what I love is having the underlying crunch for when you want it or need it. So the famous story I've told many times was Neil Hyde was running a Weird Wars Rome adventure at Genghis Khan in Colorado one year. And Neil's a fantastic GM, and he's, it's this big, cool scenario where we're all Roman legionaries, and we've tracked these, these monsters down into this cave, and uh, it turns out they're these, these evil snake men things, and they're surrounding us. And the cool parallel to history was we were uh, legionaries who knew how to, how to fight you know, side by side, we had the shield wall bonus, right? And the the snakes were essentially like you know Germanic barbarians fighting Romans back in the time. Sure. So all the mechanics were there. Yeah. And when it came to well, you can join us or we're going to wipe you out. We said we're you know we're heroes, right? We're we're gonna we're gonna fight. Well, it wasn't just a negotiation between us and the GM, and we certainly didn't know we were going to live. There's no challenge rating, right? We had to look at our odds and look at our guys and go, I think we can do it. Let's do it. We didn't, <laughs> but we gamed it out. Right. And it was yeah. on us to figure it out. And it wasn't one of the things I don't like about pure storytelling games is the GM tends to just kind of give you what you want because he wants everybody to have a fun time and a successful yep. story and a very persuasive player kind of runs the table and you have to watch this thing. Now I enjoy them and I play them, but you know, those are some of the things I don't like here yep. was, here are the odds. What do you think will happen? Wow, well, let's find out, right? And you embrace you embrace the suck sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And it well, was so fun. Well, it was it, desperate. What, it was so funny about that to me, Shane. Is a few things. One, some of our favorite stories from the tabletop are the stories you just told, which are are tragic and right. failures, and yeah. you know. And then I pulled my gun out, and and I had a critical <laughs> fail, and and it broke, and then I got shot, and, exactly. you know, and we lost Billy, and, and you know, <laughs> right. and, and that's some of our favorite stories uh, that we tell. Um, the uh, other part I lost in my head as I was telling that part. Um, well, while you're thinking, I'll tell you the other cool part. So it wasn't even just a win-lose here, right? Uh, one of our, the, the big strong guy went down. I was playing like the young noble 
uh, who wanted to, to prove his, prove his, prove he was a hero to his dad, right? So the big strong guy goes down and, or actually the, the, the sergeant, the decadus, uh, goes down and the big strong guy is, is fighting him off left and right, right? And I've already got like a couple of wounds. My other buddy's down and, uh, the, the Greek healer, a, a gal played by Sarah Martinez, is, is down behind us trying to heal, but she's like on her last legs too, right? So I realize it's crumbling. We're going to die. We've got the one big guy holding his own. So I pick up Sarah, I throw over my shoulder. I look at him and I said, hold him as long as you can. <laughs> and I ran with her, right? So this is, this is not something we would have made up or negotiated right. or whatever. It just happened yep. in, uh, holistically. And it was so cool. And, you know, the guy playing the, the big strong guy, you know, to, looks at me to this day and goes, you left me. <laughs> well, it's funny you say that. And now I remember what I was going to ma- mention to you. And it, uh, it's what I, part of what I love about having people on the podcast to talk about role playing games is and you uh, people listening, you can hear it in Shane's voice. But you, yeah, I wish you could see Shane in, in this. <laughs> and it's something very unique to role playing, which is Shane. And both of those stories just went back in time. He went back to those moments, relived yeah. it with. I mean, and that's something that's very unique about role playing. When you look at all types of gaming, whether it be computer gaming, miniature gaming, whatever, it's only role playing that can literally transport you back 5, 10, 20, 30 years to retell a story with, like you were there. Yeah. And the friendships you make, right? I mean, <gasps> once you act like a goblin in front of other grown men, <laughs> you can only get so embarrassed. Now, now we have a bond. Right? <laughs> exactly. You're That's bonded for funny. life, man. Um, so now Deadlands had its own system, uh, but you also adapted it, right? So there was a D20 version and a GURPS version. Um, how did those come about? So Steve Jackson did the GURPS version all on their own. The D20 version happened, you know, when the D20 uh, OGL came out by Ryan Dancy and, and company at WotC. And we were kind of hedging our bets business-wise. Um, you know, we, for all we knew, that was going to be the entire industry from then on, right? It was right. not a, a real healthy industry for most of us. Um, I think uh, you asked about mistakes earlier. I think a mistake we made there wasn't, was not in making the game. It was, it was a pretty good uh, version of the D20 game. And I think a lot of our cool flavor won out, but I think where we, where we didn't do so well, we didn't kind of make it our, really make it our own, right? We right. didn't add all the stuff that I think we should have, you know, instant kills and bennies and setting rules and all the stuff that, you know, we maybe could have embraced more because we weren't as into it as we were our own stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So as, as Deadlands progresses, um, at some point I would imagine, well, no, I'm not, not going to imagine. I'm going to ask, when does the idea of Savage Worlds start to start to form when you go, you know what, what so we have some core ideas here that need to go that need to stretch beyond Deadlands? Yeah. So I'm a big miniatures gamer, right? I'm a big Warhammer guy. Just I love that stuff. I love historicals. I play anything and everything. And uh, we we wanted to do a miniatures game for Deadlands. And my buddy John Hopper came up with the idea of the Great Rail Wars. So. Uh, this would, it's not a train game, but it would have these six different factions, one of which is like Bayou Vermilion, which has, you know, undead and zombies and voodoo stuff, and Black River, which is made up of the witches. And we had these, we had these cool factions, right? So, uh, I put together kind of a boiled down version of the classic system. Like I mentioned earlier, you roll, you know, numerous, uh, dice and the dice of themselves get higher. So I cut it down to just one die. Hmm. And uh, but you did keep the escalating dice from a D4 up to a D12, and and I I tried that out as a miniatures game, and honestly, it just clicked right from the start. No kidding. And uh, we got really lucky there. One of the <clears throat> one of the mi- things I mentioned with GURPS before, or, or roll down, roll under systems, yep. is it can only go so low, right? But in uh, Great Rail Wars and Savage Worlds, once you get to the D12. I've seen some people try to hack it and make like D14s and D16s and stuff, but that's actually not the intent. The intent is D12 plus one, D12 plus two, because it changes everything, right? You are now at a level where uh, ordinary success is much easier. You're, you can always critical fail. That, that can always happen. Right. But that's built in and it makes the powerful things really powerful and scary. So that worked. We changed it from, you know, that gunslinger gets five actions and it takes him 20 minutes to resolve his five shots to, you know, just roll the one die, and here's a couple of modifiers. And then the cool thing we did um, is we we added in edges and hindrances uh, to the miniatures game system. So, uh, you know, at the time, for example, in Great Rail Wars, if you have a cult, it means you know how to kill 
ghosts and hanging judges and things you couldn't normally do, right? So this is not a role-playing game. It's Boolean, right? You can do it right. you can't. And that was going really well. And uh, then I did, I call it my Midwest Odyssey, but I, I went from Virginia to St. Louis to Madison to play. Uh, I played a, a huge Fields of Honor game, the miniature system I mentioned earlier, with uh, John Kovalik and a bunch of other people up there, the uh, Dork Tower guys. And um, along the way, I stopped at some friends' houses and ran Weird Wars with this miniature system. And it was a B-17 gargoyles at night kind of thing. And that went really well. And when I came back, Deadlands was hurting because of the because of Deadlands D20, which is a, a weird thing. Isn't that something? But a lot of our classic people thought we had given up on our, our system and were only doing D20, and they didn't like D20. Right. D20 was selling like hotcakes, but it wasn't really building a fan base for us. Mm-hmm. I mean, we, we felt like we were we were losing the people we really wanted. And, and you know, we were selling books, but... Was, wasn't a place to be. So uh, I knew it was time for a new edition, and we knew the, the rule system was uh, becoming outdated for what yep. we wanted. So uh, I suggested let's let's try Great, oh, great Rail Wars, and we ran Game of Thrones, Clash of Kings at the time, before it ever became an HBO thing, and we ran a Wilderness Wars, a Weird Wars, French and Indian War thing, and then we started doing Deadland, and it all just clicked, and it worked, and we liked it, and, and I thought, okay, Business is bad. Industry's dying for for guys like me, or maybe I'm just doing it wrong. You know, I'm not yep. blaming, blaming anybody but myself. But I want this game. I want it to exist. I want to have it in my hands to play with my friends. So I'm going to make this, and then I'll go do something else. Yeah. So I made the original Savage Worlds, and uh, you know, lo and behold, it slowly gained steam. And then I put out Evernight, and that did really well. And then Fifty Fathoms did really well. And then we had another kind of crisis about the time Tour of Darkness came out. It just did not sell out the door. And I thought, okay, well, this is it. You know, it was a nice little run. And maybe I can still do some stuff on the side, but I'm going to go work on City of Heroes and I'll get somebody else to run this. And, you know, I'll just kind of oversee it. That's where uh, Simon Lucas came in, who's now our production manager and made all that beautiful Deadland stuff you're talking about. He ran the company for a couple of years while I did computer games. So I tell this story because I, I wish somebody at the time had kind of given me that hope, right? Because, I mean, things were bad. You know, yeah. it was, uh, you know, I didn't have the money to pay my mortgage sometimes and just, you know, horrible stuff, right? And these days, oh, it's so good these days because of Kickstarter, right? Yeah. And, and now the other crowdfunding things. And I, I don't, I know people, they have different views on it, right? They think it's greedy. Some people do. They think it's needy. Some people do. I call it necessary. Mm-hmm. They just don't understand the economics of companies or how we reach people. I would love to be back in every store in the country. But stores who were once overloaded with D20 games are now overloaded with board games. Yep. And, you know, they got to put all their money into magic and the stuff that turns and sells. And that's great. You know, they got to do what's best for their business. Yep. I can't reach people through the, the traditional distribution system anymore. But we do great on Kickstarter and direct on our own website. And mm-hmm. so I'm going to get to you know, the people that, that like to play our games however I can. We do sell to stores. We have a, a strong retailer program we go through, but you know, we, we just have to go where the sales are, whatever they're going to be. So there's the uh, underlying answer to your question. Well, and I mean, uh, <laughs> I've said this a few times, role-playing as a uh, economic concept is terrible, right? You sell one book and how many people are entertained right. by that one yeah. book, right? For um, years and years. For years and years and years, right? Well, I mean, when I decided to get back into role playing, I pulled out my third edition GURPS books and yeah. started goofing around looking at those. And boy, did I, I had spent that money just a little while ago, some 25 <laughs> years ago, you know? And, but it's interesting to see, um, like you said, the new paths, so you've got things like itch, you've got things like drive through RPG, you've got things like Kickstarter, uh, Patreon has been huge for the RPG industry and has allowed creators, you know, to do what they do. Right. Um, and the, the reality to your point, I think Shane is that if we didn't have those, we wouldn't be where we are. The industry would not be where it is. I, I don't think we're about that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, and I don't think you're alone. I think that that's been true for a lot Absolutely. of people. Um, and you know, I heard people every once in a while talk about bad things about Kickstarter, but I, I always end up saying the same thing, which is the best thing about Kickstarter is you don't have to use it. 
Exactly right. And what so, they don't understand is, you know, when we printed a book before, if we were in a cash crunch, which was all the time, yeah. I had to go borrow money from my parents, right, who who maybe at the time had to take out a loan on their house, Yep. which, you know, boy, I'm glad I don't have to live in those times anymore. But, you know, the, the pressure and the stress of things like that, if, if you're conscientious about it, is really hard. And, you know, I, there's a whole nother show, right? That, that was a, a yeah. bad, dark time. But the worst part is you might print, you know, just 2,000 books, which, you know, wasn't a lot at the time, and not sell any of them. And now you can't make any money. You owe people money. And then you got to pay a landfill to take them, which I've had to do. Oh. Right? So the best part about Kickstarter is not that we make more money. It's not that we get it, uh, you know, the direct sales, although those are all wonderful things, too. Yeah. It's that I know what the demand is. Right. We put out a Kickstarter and three people sign up. We don't make it. That very thing happened with Conan Rise of Monsters. We tried to do, a, with another company I was part of, we tried to do a pre-painted uh, Conan miniatures game. But the wind had already been taken out of the sales by Monolith's uh, Conan game. We didn't know that when we bought the license. That was kind yep. of a mess, but you, know, you deal with it. But had we printed that game and then had to sit on it, you know, we all would have had to put in, because especially you know, pre-painted resin miniatures, you're talking about a $600,000 print bill. You know, we'd yep. all still be working other jobs trying to pay off that debt. So we put it out. Didn't work out. We canceled it. We lost, we lost a lot of money, but nowhere near what we would have lost otherwise. So that's the thing people don't see. They just see, wow, this made $600,000. Shane's got $600,000. Yeah, that's how it works, right, well, Shane? <laughs> sure, I do. You guys can't see it on the video. He's sitting on the pile of Deadlands money. I, <laughs> Swimming in it. Like yeah, I had to tell duck. him to put his camera up. <laughs> no, but I would imagine, too, and this is um, something I've had a, several conversations about, but I'd like to hear your perspective on it. It changes how you have to manage things, though. So, it, as you know, what, that's great. The, the model is great because you get to know, you know how many books to print. Right. Um, you know, you'd mentioned the 2000 and not selling any of them. That's a problem. It's also a problem if you print 2000 and the demands for 10,000. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> because eventually yeah. you're not going to fulfill that. Right. But right. Kickstarter solves that. But the other challenge has to be, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. Um, the economics of of the project, getting the money all up front. And then there's there's no more money, but the project has to be finished and the project has to be delivered. That's got to be a challenge. Uh, I don't think I understand. Could you? So um, you did the dead, let's use Deadlands, right? Okay. The most recent Deadlands. You did the Deadlands Kickstarter. Um, I signed up for it, as did several other thousands Thank of people. You. <laughs> You're welcome. And uh, the money is transferred to you by Kickstarter. Right. And now that's it. Now you have to take that money oh, and, yes. and produce what you promised and yeah. it's not like you're going to come back to me and say, hey, Craig, you know, I know if, I know you paid 150 bucks, but, you know, you got another 50 and we'll get this finished out. Ooh. I mean, th that's got to be a huge management challenge to make sure that, you know, you fulfill based off of the limit, not the limited, not limited funds that you've got. Your budget yeah. set. Right. OK. Yeah, I totally get it. Yeah. So uh, I think we've all seen numerous creators who have fallen into that hole. Yep. And had I been younger and not have had the experiences that I had, I might have too. Mm -hmm. Certainly no better than, than any of them. Fortunately, it came along at a time where I had learned very hard lessons. And, um, you know, after I got to a certain point where we were, uh, we were in the black, I don't commission things that I don't already have the money in the bank for. And that money does not get touched, right? Yeah. So, you know, if I don't get paid, I don't get paid. But, uh, you know, they, the bills always will. And, um, you know, some of that is, you know, I was raised by my parents. If you, if you, if the, the expression was, if you owe somebody a penny, you walk 10 miles to pay it back. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and the hard part is you, you believe that to your core. And when you can't do it, it destroys you. Yeah. It did me. So, you know, that's when I learned I, I have to have this amount before I'll do anything else. And again, that's where, where crowdfunding really helps. But then there's managing that money. Right. Right. And where so many people go wrong and, uh, you know, I, I could invite several friends on here to discuss it. <laughs> <laughs> they get a ton of money and they think, OK, well, this is big now. Right. We've got to make this and we got to do this and we're going to expand. and I'm going to hire this guy. And we're going to hire this girl and we're going to do this. And uh, yeah. It's it, it often leads to tears. You know, it maybe does. it doesn't. Good, you know, more power to them. But uh, you've you got to nail down. Well, what am I going to pay the 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 
the manufacturer, you know, the printer. And most importantly, how am I going to handle shipping? Right. right. So on, on the Deadlands Kickstarter, uh, our shipping bill at the moment is at $120,000 on that. Right now, people pay for the shipping on that yep. one. And I think we only lost 10 or 20,000 bucks on the shipping this time, which is pretty Incredible. good. But, you know, people just, they just don't get it. They, yeah. they see, you know, Amazon next day delivery for free. They see, especially the board games, right? Because the board game guys, what they'll do is they'll say, here's a $200 box set and we're going to add all this stuff and we're going to ship it to you for free or 15 bucks. Well, it's really a hundred dollar box set and they just build all that. Yeah, and I think most people are savvy enough to get that now. But we sell a book with an MSRP on it, and yeah. then I got to charge you shipping. And then people get upset because the shipping charge is more than the cost of the book to like Europe, for example. Like, well, I don't control the shipping cost. Yeah. I can charge you more for the book if that makes you feel better. Right. Which is how, you know, 460 page books by certain other companies do better because <laughs> it costs about the same to ship. What was the question? <laughs> well, just, oh, managing just, the money, the, yeah. managing the money, so that you know this, that you're able to fulfill it with it with a yeah. with with a but with a firm budget. Yeah. So you know, planning diligence. I do a lot of the work myself. Yeah. Uh, we do pay well these days to the people who work for us, but we you know we keep it tight and focused, and we we don't take a lot of uh, dumb risks that I certainly took in the past. Right. And I also put the money in a very uh, safe, like money market fund while I'm waiting. So it gains a little interest and that helps, sure. right? And offset some of that loss. So since, you know, we print overseas most of our stuff, we generally pay a down payment about three months in and then pay the rest of the balance about six months in, five to six months, depending. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a significant amount of, of interest you can earn on, on a big chunk like that, right? So that's been a big help to us. That's great. So, and, you know, I'd recommend anybody do that, but don't put it in like, you know, don't put it in Tesla or something, right? <laughs> put it in Just do Bitcoin. Safe. Come on. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> so guys, we're going to take another break. When we get back from this break, I want to dive more into Savage Land or Savage World. Sorry. We'll be right back. <laughs> There are so many online retailers. It can be hard to find one that is trustworthy, has great prices, along with some reliable customer service. On the third floor, we love ordering our gaming goodies from Gadzooks Gaming. Their selection of terrain, miniatures, dice, custom decor, and conversion bits are curated for gamers by gamers. You'll find they have what you need and what you didn't know you needed to take your gaming fun to the next level. If you mention Third Floor Wars in the cart notes of your order, you'll also get a free gift and you'll help support the podcast. Check out gadzooksgaming.com and mention Third Floor Wars on checkout to get that free gift. So we got kind of the beginning of the origin story of Savage Worlds. Um, I think, but the, probably the first thing I want to tr understand is, and I didn't realize uh, this, Shane, that you were a GURPS guy, um, because really, I mean, there's only two universal systems really out there right now, and that's you and you and them, right? Um, as far as the biggies, is that a fair statement? Uh, I, I might count fate. No, oh, that's, you know what? I, I don't I mean, think about as fate as a universal system, but uh, uh, I, good call. I, I, I think it is. Yep. Yeah. No, I agree. Um, when you were migrating from the great rail wars and you realizing the savage worlds was going to become a universal uh rpg system in your mind what made it different than gurps why not just do gurps um, yeah just the setting rules just this again the setting rules that we talked about yeah yeah and then a few bells and whistles that were important to me <clears throat> uh like aces exploding dice uh, yep. you know, getting that, uh, whoa, 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 whoa feeling, right? Which is awesome. You know, kind of like rolling three ones in GURPS, right? Yeah. Uh, that feeling. And, uh, then some of the stuff I learned from, which I, I got from Torg. One of the other things I got from Torg, uh, is letting face characters have cool things to do in combat. And that was really new as far as I know yeah. to Torg, right? And I think our first attempts at it in Savage Worlds weren't, weren't as good. These days, with our tests and support rules, I think they're they're really strong. I think Torg's still better there, actually, uh, okay. just the way the cards work and everything else. But but we're pretty good. 
So I've heard this said before, and I'd be curious to know whether you agree with this or like this categorization. But I often hear people say, look, if you want to tell a pulp story, you want Savage Worlds is the way to go. Um, do you think that's fair? That Savage Worlds is best uh, for pulp? Or is that a, uh, a misclassification that I keep hearing? Best, maybe. But, you know, like I said, I just ran a, a Russian mafia game, which was a, a hard, gritty game. The, actually, the Weird Whaling thing I ran, too, was a, a very gritty game as well. So we we do rifts, we do Pathfinder, we do dungeon crawls, we do supers. Uh, people love Necessary Evil. I've run Necessary Evil and Necessary Evil 2. So, you know, t- to me, it does everything. It right. is all about the setting rules and, you know, and your style. Um, there's, there's tricks to it. Like uh, what we learned on Pathfinder is... You know, a D20 game is designed to slowly attrit your hit points and resources, yep. right? And the encounters are written that way. So you might uh, hit a, a little creature that's not going to pose any challenge, but takes away a few hit points over mm-hmm. and over and over and over. Our encounters don't really work like that. You know, we want these big set piece battles that are more epic and dramatic. And again, not a, not an aspersion, right? It's, it's just right. different it's, styles. Different way to do things, right. Yeah. So when we did uh, Rise of the Rune Lords for Pathfinder we looked at ways we could do that without all fundamentally altering their story, right? Which sometimes meant having, uh, you know, critters come in from one part of a, uh, of a manor house or a dungeon or something and join in the fight a little, a little more easily than they might otherwise. Right. With things like that. That's interesting. Um, so at what point do you sit back and decide, you know what? We, we need a new edition. So when did Savage Worlds start to age to the point where you said, you know what? We, we, need, we need to put things out. And we need to change a few things. How do you know when it's time? Great question. Um, we did the $10 rule books and we felt, uh, you know, we didn't make any money on those, but we felt we had seeded the market and got people to look at, you know, what we were doing as much as, much as we were going to reach. And we had at that point, more resources, uh, you know, money, and we had a new way to reach people, Kickstarter. Yep. Uh, and we, a lot of the art, for example, in uh, Savage Worlds Deluxe, the previous ones, great stuff. We didn't own most of it, right? It was uh. second use pieces that the artists owned. And as we got to Suede, um, you know, I wanted to A, fix up things like the, the test and support system I just mentioned to make that better. I wanted to clean up some of the things that were not so clear in the edges and hindrances and picky stuff. We needed a better index. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, it sounds we like just, someone has brought that up before. You. <laughs> oh, Lord, yes. Uh, and we just wanted to make it, you know, more cohesive and, and cleaner and, and prettier. And, um, and, and we did. Yeah. Yeah. I'd be curious, um, once the most recent version of Savage Worlds got out there, is there anything from uh, when it was released that you heard back that surprised you, either good or bad? Um, I'm sure there was a lot of feedback that you anticipated, right? It was your game and, and you made it. But was there anything that you saw or heard that made you go, wow, I had not thought about that or that's interesting? Um, what was some of the feedback that maybe surprised you? Um, surprised. The I guess it was before the release of Suede, but the change to the shaken rules and how adamant people were about getting, So you used to have to roll uh, a four to recover and an eight to act right away, and we changed it to you get a four, you get to act right away. And, you know, I've played hundreds of games now and run hundreds of games, and watching people sit there while their character, you know, makes that roll or doesn't make the roll and doesn't do anything – it's just not good. Yeah. But people, you know, good players were using that as kind of a stun lock mechanic, which is great. But we had that built in with the test rules and distracting and, you know, other ways besides just this one simple way. Yeah. Uh, so I was I was a little surprised there was such resistance to it. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a pretty, you know, do what you want kind of guy. But guys, you're wrong. It's better. This way. <laughs> <laughs> I think the the. Feedback that I actually was expecting and was not disappointed by was the feedback to the art and the final page in the book. Very, very nice. Um, so what's next then uh, for Savage Worlds in your mind? So, uh, you know, Savage Pathfinder is, is the project that I just finished working on. The rest of the team is cleaning up, taking the feedback, getting all the rest of it out. And that was a, a big haul. And I think some people are wondering, why didn't we get the Fantasy Companion out? And the truth is, we needed to get Pathfinder done first, because 
it really let us look deep at the dungeon crawl uh, mentality, you know, of, of a D20 based game. Yeah. To not only incorporate some of those elements into the upcoming fantasy companion, but also to differentiate what our uh, other kinds of fantasy might feel like. For example, we're working on Deadlands Dark Ages. Okay. And, you know, that is a, that is a much darker, tougher game than, you know, than a dungeon crawl high fantasy kind of game. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's harsher. You die more. <laughs> it's, yeah. <laughs> it's brutal. And, uh, figuring out the differences in those things is, is just critical to the companions, which is, is my next big haul. So I've got a lot of work done on, on all four of the core ones, horror, supers, fantasy, and sci-fi. Uh, we're, we're trying to figure out now, you know, what, how much of the Pathfinder stuff do we include in the fantasy companion? And yep. I don't really mean like the class edges. I mean like monsters, right? So if you're a, a, a pinnacle fan, a Savage Worlds fan, and you buy a lot of this stuff, I don't want to make you buy all the monsters that you already paid for in the Savage Worlds or Savage Pathfinder bestiary again. Right. But if you're not into Savage Pathfinder, I want you to have all those cool monsters. So that that's uh, that's something we're we're debating pretty fiercely. Well, how are you? So I'd be curious. So I'm sorry. A, okay. a challenge has got to be there is, you know, why when both are out there, right? When, once, yep. once you get the fantasy out there, the Pathfinder's out there what makes me want to play one versus the other? You've got to make the, you've got to make them distinct, even though they're both savage worlds. Don't yeah, you? Yeah. Well, I mean, you want savage pathfinder. If you want to play D 20 stuff, you want a fantasy companion. If I want to do my savage Warhammer campaign again, God, oh man, that's so much fun. <laughs> I'm a, I, you know, I, I love the Warhammer world. It's my, it's my go-to fantasy world. I've got seven armies in my garage, you know, I've played great. nine different tact- strategic campaigns. In, in, in the you know, recent years. So I'm, a, I'm just a big Warhammer nut. And I've run, you know, my own independent fantasy world stuff too. Plus we did things like Evernight and so on. So, you know, there, to me, there really are two flavors of fantasy. There's D20 stuff and everything else. Everything yeah. else is a, is a wide range of stuff. And that's what we try to cover with the fantasy companion. That makes sense. That makes a ton of sense. Well, guys, we're going to take one more break. When we get back from this break, I'm going to take advantage. I'm going to take advantage of the fact that Shane has been here the whole time I was asleep and away from the industry. We're going to kind of talk about really the last 25, 30 years of gaming. We'll be right back. Howdy, folks. Craig here. Now, if you love gadgets as much as we do, you're going to love the new Third Floor Wars Gadget Bundle from Schooner Labs. Branded with the logo of your favorite podcast, it comes with two measuring multi-tools, a compass stepper for those tight and important movements, along with a compact dashboard to track your turn, strat, and scheme scoring along with your soul stones and pass tokens. It is the perfect bundle for anyone who plays Malifaux or just wants to look cool while doing it. The link is in the show notes. Check them out and help support your favorite gaming podcast. So in some ways, Shane, I'm going to ask us to go back in time again. So we're going to hit the rewind um, because, I mean, you're a Redbox guy, right? You played old D&D yeah, and you're still playing role playing games today. Um, in your mind, when what was the the breakout from Dungeon and Dragons? So when you look back at this uh, as a historian now, when did when did we start to see role playing really flex beyond D&D in your mind? Oh, wow. Because wow. for a while it was just D and D. Yeah, I mean, there's so many early examples. You know, you can think of everything like Bushido to Traveler to TSR's own stuff, Top yeah. Secret, Star Frontiers, all that stuff. Uh, I don't know how much it spread outside of kind of a core group. I guess you know maybe the next genera- iteration to me would be the era of Deadlands, uh, Legend of the Five Rings. Yeah. Where uh, maybe Shadowrun, yeah. uh, certainly Shadowrun, even you know before us, uh, kind of the the story based games where there's a you know it's a big world and the story of the world matters as much as make your own adventures uh, with this stuff. So I guess that would kind of be you know, the the next step in my mind. And then I think there was a, a big emphasis on mechanics and resolution. You know, a lot of player power, fake points, adventure points, 
right uh, that kind of stuff and uh probably a lot of uh you know make your own kind of things as 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 we realize that the creativity of the people we play with which i think you know for me that's probably why i bought every single gurps book there was i wasn't going to play every one but i was going to take bits and pieces from that's them what for I did. you know elric or yeah just like yeah. you for whatever i'm going to yeah. play yeah, there was always a good nugget. Even if you never did the setting in those GURP splat books, there was always a, like a nugget in there. You're like, ooh, I'm going to use right. that here. Yeah. Um, they were very, very good about that. Dancing is how- a physical hard spill? <laughs> All right, then. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> well, how about uh, the the Rise and Fall of White Wolf then? Let's talk about, because um, in some ways that was a bit of a, um, oh, a yeah. major moment in the history. Yeah, that was that's a great breakout moment, right? So they came along and, and they, they built this huge community that I think did not cannibalize from the traditional grognards playing you know, D&D white box up through Traveler and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so that's a great point. And, and they built a community off, you know, something that was kind of a hot trend at the time, Vampire Lestat and, and all that stuff. Uh, and and I, I love the White Wolf guys. I worked you know, with them and for them on, on various occasions. I, I'm not a fan of how some of the, the stuff in the game turned out. I think it's... Um, I don't mind dark, you know, I write dark and I write horror. I think it maybe encourages villainy maybe a bit too much for my mm-hmm. tastes. Yep. Uh, and then when you spread it into the live action thing, you know, it's it can it can be a little dicey sometimes at conventions, but I've also seen great ones, so yeah. dear god, don't don't spam me with hate mail people. <laughs> uh but it is it is why I make games about heroes, I guess, right? right? Even even our villains and necessary evil, they're super villains, but they're not psychopaths typically. Well, I mean, you know, that's a good distinction, isn't it? Yep. Yeah, yeah. We did the same thing in City of Villains, right? Some people would write us and say, "Well, I want to go around and kill children." No, you're Doctor Doom, you're Magneto, you're right. the Shocker. You know, you're these silly, but you can put heart and love and story even into silly villains, and that's yeah. that's where I I. Yeah, and ho- hopefully you added that guy to a list somewhere. <laughs> <He wrote that laughs> oh man, you don't Computer need to play City of Villains. You need to go talk to somebody. That's what he's <laughs> yeah. saying. Right Can I call a counselor for you, buddy? <laughs> oh god. Now, how about the rise of the indie game scene um, when the Bakers put out Powered by the Apocalypse, and really how that kind of made a huge, major shift? Um, as somebody watching that happen, what were your thoughts on that? I, I guess I've never really been part of that scene. You know, I, I certainly know their Kickstarters do well. And I met Vincent Baker at a, a show we were guests at in Tucson. And he seems like a great guy. I've played a couple. They're not my thing. But, yeah. uh, you know, more power to them. I, I think, you know, maybe the next rise to me was was really the the Kickstarter revolution and what went along with it, the accessibility of layout software. Right. So like my buddy, Tim Brown, who was the co-designer for Dark Sun, when he worked on Space 1889 and Traveler and that kind of stuff, you know, they use the old, um, I don't even know the right terms for it, the, the typeset machines. Right. I mean, it was, uh, I can't imagine. You know, nowadays, anybody can pick up professional publishing software. You know, you can pay for the Adobe suite or you can get, you know, one or two others that are, are free or cheap and, and, and make something look pretty good. Yeah. And you can go on Kickstarter and and make even a couple of thousand bucks, even if it's only just PDF or something. Right. And and that low barrier to entry has created a lot of eh, but also some incredible creative gems. Right. I've got you know, a lot of PDFs and, and physical books you know, on my shelves yeah. that would never have seen the light of day had not those two things come about. Oh, I would actually have to say the rise of Facebook as well. As yeah. much as it pisses off a lot of us these days, and it does, uh, being able to reach a huge market like that and say, hey, buy my $10 Fantasy Heartbreaker PDF, you know, you could reach a thousand, ten thousand people where before you might have reached 50 at a convention that you went to and some little bulletin board somewhere. So, you know, those well, you three things create communities wow. at the same time. Yeah. No, yeah. no question. Yeah. So now that begs the question for me, Shane, what non pinnacle games do you look at and go, wow, this is awesome. I love playing it. Or even if you don't play it, you just look at it and go like this was a big deal. This was a game changer. Uh, what are some favorite games that you haven't made? So RPGs, board games, both. Sure. Okay. So uh, RPGs, I think the new D&D is great. I, I, my, uh, my, my son actually ran a campaign of it for me and my buddies 
fun. two years ago, uh, Tomb of Annihilation, and then he ran his own campaign because he just never played D and D. He thought he did because I ran it for him when he was little. He just didn't remember. <laughs> but you know the the fact that all these celebrities and stuff are into D and D now, and it's just huge, right? Yeah. Uh, my my youngest wanted to play it. And they play with their friends and, and got into it. And I think uh, Mike Merles and company just did a great job with the new D&D. I think it's fantastic. I think the way that they're doing the, the they're, they're essentially their plot point books, like uh, Salt Marsh and Storm King's, Storm King's Thunder. Yep. And, you know, all this stuff, just brilliant. I think it's great. Uh, so I think they're doing good work. Uh, I've seen some, some brilliant little ones. Uh, I'm trying to think. I've got a. Some cool stuff on my shelf. I think the stuff that maybe interests me the most are some of the cool little miniatures games like Gaslands or Dracula's uh, Dracula's America is really cool. Oh, okay. RPGs. Forbidden Lands is really neat. Oh, I, I'm such a huge fan that of cool? Forbidden Lands. Yeah, that's Love good it. stuff. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Torg I, is great. Everything coming out of out of Free League right now is very interesting, I think. Um, oh, yeah, I agree. The alien system is very interesting. Yeah, the Mark Borg stuff. Yeah. Weird, right? But man, is stylistic. it fun to watch. <laughs> it is, but it's fun to watch YouTube videos on, right? <laughs> you no, know, I agree. I yeah. agree. And board games, I mean, man, there's so many cool board games, right? And looking at the, the fantastic mechanics, and I love it when... So I like Euro games. And I love Ameritrash, and if you know those two terms... Uh, the ones that I, the, the games that stick with me though, are where the mechanics and the theme really mesh together, right? Yeah. Like the Game of Thrones board game is just brutal from turn one. You can't sit and turtle up. You're going to have to backstab somebody, make an alliance with somebody. It just works great, right? Brilliant design. And there's lots of games like that, that we get together every Wednesday night. We haven't since COVID, we tend to do our gaming online right now. So we're doing a lot of RPGs. But yeah. me and my buddies, we get together every Wednesday night and play whoever's got the newest board game. It's like, oh my gosh, so much good stuff. It is it is truly a golden age for gamers. Oh, for tabletop gaming, it's unbelievable. Uh, unbelievable. It's um, <laughs> so I'd be curious to know, when you're playing a, a non-pinnacle RPG, when you're playing a board game that you haven't made, are you able to turn off the producer, creator, designer brain and just sit back and enjoy it? Or are you, is there a part of your brain that's always going, ooh, that's interesting. I wonder how they came up with that. Or boy, oh, I, would, I, I like great. that. Or that was a dumb resolution oh, system. I would <laughs> say, I'd say my designer brain is on idle. I, I, I am a, a, a gamer first and foremost. And, you know, even if we're playing a game that I don't really like the mechanics of, you know, I'm going to I'm going to be my character and I'm going to do silly things. And I'm going to have the biggest time possible. And then afterwards, I'm going to bitch about how I couldn't do what I wanted. Right. Uh, here's a here's a great example. I was playing one of the incarnations of, of Warhammer, the RPG, a few years back. And uh, it's one that I generally like, but it was, you know, five heroes fighting like seven beast men. And it took for freaking ever. And had we been doing Savage Worlds, because I have done that very same thing, <laughs> you know, it would just fly and yeah. then we could get on to f 50 more things that night, right? So yep. uh, those kinds of things as a, I'd say more as a fan of what, of our style of play, you know, you can read that as our game, but really it is our style. Sure. Uh, more so than the hypercritical game designer. I can, I can put that brain on too. That's good. But I tend to do it more as a, as a fan and a gamer. But it sounds like there's some Monday morning quarterbacking that happens as well, right? So oh, when yeah. the game is over, you start going back and breaking it down in your head. Right. And, and don't get me wrong. We did to our own stuff, too. Like, why? Why did I write that? This is stupid. <laughs> this is awful. What was I thinking? And, you know, fortunately, the game is at a maturity level now where there's not much of that. Yeah. But certainly, like, sometimes a special ability for a monster or a, you know, a weird dramatic task in an adventure might slip through. And we go, yeah, yeah, I'm embarrassed by this one. But that's rare, fortunately, these days. But, yeah, that's we do good. it. And certainly in playtest, you know, we, we tear it up pretty hard. Outside of going to uh, Pinnacle's website, is there um, any other place that people are listening that want more Shane should go to? Uh, not more Shane, more Pinnacle. So our Pinnacle Facebook, this is the official Savage Worlds group is where all the action is. We have a Pinnacle page too, but the Facebook uh, Savage Worlds group is where it's at. I don't do Twitter. I, uh, I do, you know, videos and, and, and podcasts like this on occasion, but I'm uh, otherwise kind of a private guy. I, uh, you know, when people ask, I'm happy to talk forever, but I don't really, I, I work all the time. So I don't feel the need to go out and tell everybody how smart I am. Because <laughs> that wouldn't that wouldn't that wouldn't work very well. That's really funny. <laughs> or last very long. 
<laughs> and that makes you unique in the industry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe. There's a lot of those kind of quiet guys, I suppose. Uh, that's great. Well, Shane, I really appreciate you making the time, my friend. Well, I appreciate you having me on. This was fun. You, you I- said at the beginning you wanted a conversation, and that's what I felt like. Well, good. Good, good, good. Uh, I'll mark that as a success. And for those of you who listened all the way to the end, thanks for staying around. Take care. Hey, did you hear that? You leveled up. You finished another episode of Tabletop Talk from Third Floor Wars. If you want more from the third floor, follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Head on over to our YouTube channel. It is packed with painting tutorials, gaming tips, battle reports, and role-playing actual plays. Did you enjoy this episode? Why don't you send a link to one of your friends so they can enjoy it too? Last but not least, write us a review on your podcatcher of choice. This helps us find listeners almost as cool as you. And here we actually covered a lot of this stuff as well, Shane. So I expect this to be a short thing. Before we go into this last um, segment, though, is there anything that we've left on the table? Is there anything that you want to make sure that we talk about that we emphasize that maybe we've missed? No, I think this has been pretty interesting. I think I would enjoy it as a as a fan. Well, that's good. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, I'll bring us back. Uh, very went fascinating. A little long on that one. Sorry. No, it was great, man. It was great. Like, like I said, you, I'll, I'll worry about whether it's All interesting right. or not, Shane. You just talk. You tell okay. stories, and um, that's well, my job, not your job. All right. <laughs> hey, let me grab some water real quick. Take your time, man. All right. So what's good is we've already typed, talked about Great Whale Wars. We've already talked about the beginnings of this. So I'm actually going to kind of start at mid-system for us. Is that all right? Sure. Great. Uh, very interesting. God, I wish that um, I have tried the only MMOs that I ever got into. I couldn't get into work, World of Warcraft, couldn't get into that was City of Heroes and City of Villains. Yeah, it was That's, amazing, wasn't it? No, it was, no, uh, they, they were my 2 a.m. games. Yeah. And I, I think part of City of Heroes was that community. Oh, I've never amazing. seen such a positive community. No. We talked no. about that in house all the time. <clears throat> Especially That's a really good these point. days. You know, they're so toxic these days. Most. And I've searched, I, like I have, I have chased my city of heroes, city of villains, dragon so many times trying to find that experience again. And I've yet to do it. Yeah. I've yet to do it. It, uh, it, it still stands as a landmark game yeah, or I games, agree. I should say. All right. Um, all right. This is the part I'm excited. Well, I'm actually excited about both these next segments. So, all right, I'll bring us back, Shane. Okay. That was perfect. My friend. Thank you. All right. So here's something I don't completely know yet, Shane, and it'd probably make more sense for me to find out before we come back on. What was first, Deadlands or Pinnacle? Pinnacle. (laughs) Pinnacle was. I thought it was, but I I didn't want to sound like an idiot. A historical rule set using that guy right there as the cover. No kidding. Talk about why and how and all that, if that's interesting. It definitely is. So I'll bring us back. Okay. You still here? Look, uh, the podcast is over. And you sat through all of the breaks and bloopers? Well, I mean, if you're here, you might as well run over to patreon.com and become a supporter. Don't forget to rate and review this podcast too while you're at it on whatever platform you're listening to. I do appreciate you sticking around. Take care.